We're at an extraordinary tipping point of human history. If you go back to you know, the, uh, the 1800s, we had a billion people on the planet. By World War II, we had two billion people on the planet. And you fast forward today, and we have seven billion. Expected to hit nine billion by 2040. We are an extraordinary expansion of human life. And human life is an extraordinary thing, and we're going to get into that today, that it's not just a story about the human cells and the extraordinary worlds you represent. It's about an ecosystem that programs you to do what you do every day. And the extraordinary thing I want to shift our consciousness on today is the fact that this is not just seven billion people. Because there's a tendency for us to think of this number, this explosive growth of humans as being dangerous to the planet or being an imbalance or we have literally politicians and people thinking maybe we should try to undermine human physiology, undermine human fertility to decrease this growth rate. Maybe we're growing too fast. Maybe we're a virus on the planet. Maybe we are the biggest risk to ourselves. But there's an incredible argument to balance that philosophy out. And that's that this globe actually has seven billion souls. That's a much different reality. We're not just seven billion frail human bodies that expect to pop in, maybe live 40 to 70 years, maybe a few lucky ones make it to 100. No, we are seven billion souls that showed up right now. That's a fascinating fact. And you guys have identified yourselves as purpose-driven people. You are expending an extraordinary amount of effort time, money, brain cells, attention to transformation of yourself. You guys, as a biohacking community, I think are really pushing the envelope of human consciousness. Why are we here? We heard a great talk on purpose this morning. What is your purpose? It's not your human body's purpose. Your human body is there as a vessel, as a transport agent for your soul that is left into the body right now. And we should be humbled by who is here now. And so look around the room to your left and your right. Because you didn't show up here to listen to me. You actually showed up here to be part of a community. And so the person to your left, to your right, to forward and back of you are far more important to you in this mission of unity and this mission of oneness that we have the potential to realize in this lifetime. And if we don't, we're going to tip to a very negative outcome. And so you are here now, so you have untapped wisdom. You have untapped potential. You wouldn't be here if you didn't sense that. If you thought you had maxed out, you know what, I've got this thing called biology, I've got this thing called life, I've got it all figured out, you wouldn't be here. Despite the fact that you guys are probably in the top 1% or perhaps top 0.1% of physiology and biology in the world today, you have a real sense that you're scratching the surface of potential. And that's my humility every day. No matter how much I learn, no matter what I see under the microscope, I have a sense of, oh my gosh, we just are scratching the surface of human potential. And without you guys in my community, I would give up hope. Because there's too much to know. There's too much information that we would have to tap into. But you are each here with great purpose. Each of you are a powerful, powerful agent of change in your environment. And so what I'm going to share with you today is a team of 40 people, not just me. This is way beyond my intelligence that I'm sharing with you today. Our, our, our team of 40 includes our intensely intelligent science team, includes educators, social media experts who get the word out to the world and everything else. This team of 40 is who stands behind me on this stage, and I'll show you their pictures at the end because I want a hand of applause for their huge work. But ultimately, they're just a microcosm of all of you guys. And we could literally spend the next hour and a half giving a round of ovation applause to every single one of you in the audience because you've already transformed your communities and you're becoming more potent with each piece of information you have. So I congratulate you. You are my acknowledgement that you guys are as powerful as I am. You guys are as powerful as any agent on earth and you're here with great purpose. Let's now be humbled by the others that are, have leapt into these human bodies. Perhaps the most potent is the autism community. Our group works extensively with Autism One and another other autism communities around the world, and we are humbled by these children. My clinic, all of my staff is so humbled every time we see one of these children come into our space. 
there's a lot of talk that this number of 1 in 45 is inflated or somehow is just because we've changed the diagnostic criteria of autism, that's why we see it. But the numbers really betray that reality. In 1975, we had 1 in 5,000 children with autism. By 2012, the bar on the right here, you see 1 in 88 children. Now, so you can argue maybe we really, you know, we're diagnosing it better, we're more aware of it and everything else. Well, as a clinician who sees autistic children, I'll tell you it's pretty unlikely we missed this in 1975. If we did, we were the stupidest people on the planet. An autistic child comes into my clinic so overwhelmed by their environment that one of the main mechanisms of survival is to hit their head against a wall or their crib hour after hour in the day, that they may show up with a huge callus on their forehead from where they routinely strike their head against a wall to narrow their attention down to this one spot of pain so that they're not overwhelmed by the rest of the cacophony. That's hard to miss as a doctor, let alone a parent. You think our parents really missed this phenomenon in 1975? But then if we go further, we can show you what's happened just in the last three years. And so by 2015, we had doubled in three years, the rate of autism to one in 44, and we're still diving. So we're, we're down well below that in the autism community. But let's say maybe we need to look for other data points to suggest, is this real? Could we really be in an epidemic of disease? Could we really be seeing a situation where this pre prevalence of this massive neurologic injury is happening with such prevalence that we're missing it or somehow we're exaggerating this? But then we look to the other side of the spectrum, we see the same patterns in cancer see this explosive growth, this doubling of the cancer rate between 1990 to 2015. That's an extraordinary reality. We're now hitting one in two males in the United States with cancer. We just hit 49% a couple years ago. So 50% of the, of, the, of the U.S. male will die with cancer. Not necessarily from the cancer, but they will diagnose with the cancer before they die. That doesn't even count skin cancer. These are solid tumors and everything else. It should be biologically impossible for cancer to grow double a rate in 15, 25 years. It should be biologically impossible because it's been defined as a genetic disease. It is not a genetic disease. If you go to the American Cancer Institute, I used to design chemotherapy at the University of Virginia. I was on the dark side of this equation, and I can guarantee you we were practicing a paradigm that said this is a genetic disease, there's nothing you can do about it, and right now if you or some loved one is getting diagnosed with cancer, you've heard your oncologist say, it doesn't matter what you eat. You know, it's surgery, chemo, radiation. And it was after about six years of being in this cancer environment, this cancer research, that I suddenly realized that there is not a single cancer that has ever occurred, occurred from a lack of chemotherapy. Yeah. Is that right? right? There's no such thing as a cancer that occurred because the patient hadn't gotten radiation before. There was no cancer that occurred because they had been under-surgerized and that's kind of where things are heading with medicine. It's looking like we should do prophylactic prostate removal, remove your colon, remove both your breasts by about age 10 so you don't get cancer. And you see actually, sadly, I mean we laugh, but sadly we have people in Hollywood getting bilateral mastectomies to tell the public this is your best approach. If you have a genetic marker and you have a genetic disease called cancer prevalence, then you should get both your breasts removed before. It's an absolute crazy world that we're living in. And so we need to shift gears, we need to look more broadly. Let's look at these, these autistic children. It turns out that one of the hallmarks of this is toxicity, and the, you guys probably don't need to be taught this, but everything in this hall and everything else is touting some sort of detoxification. And that detox has become necessary because we are toxic as a population. But even if you look within the same family, you see huge variation. And so I think that, is there a uh, laser pointer on this thing? That's all right, I don't think there is. Um, the light blue bars are looking at the rates in uh, non-affected siblings. And so if you look at the brothers and sisters and the parents, the first degree relatives of children with autism, they have a very predictable steady state of heavy metals in the bloodstream. And then the dark blue lines are the uh, matched controls of the autistic children. So even in the same household, even in the same environment, you see this incredible concentration, this sponging of toxin from their environment. These autistic children are suffering greatly. And of course, we have mildly affected autistic kids. And what we see again and again in these children is they are geniuses. These brilliant minds that are under attack. These brilliant minds that are overwhelmed with information. That brilliance, I want to remind you, is something the soul probably guessed at or knew was going to happen. Can you imagine the soul that would jump into an autistic body? Can you imagine 
the intensity of that decision for a soul that's as old as time itself, jumping into a human body knowing that by age one and a half it's going to be so overwhelmed by its environment that it will be striking its head against its crib to try to stay sane. We need to have incredible humility around these children. I think they are here to be the canary in the coal mine. They are here to change consciousness on what we are doing as human beings. Powerful, powerful beings. And so let's take a look now and, and see what's happening with the microbiota. So the, the microbiome is a broad term that we should define quickly as being not just bacteria, because there's been a prevalence of, of talk about probiotics and et cetera in the, in the lay public as well as the medical community over the last 30 years. But in reality, the bacteria are a very small segment of the microbiome. But here we have this neurologic injury to these children that's developing usually after birth. So they're usually born and go through normal milestones of development for the first year of life as a typical pattern for an autistic child. And then suddenly, around 18 months to 24 months, they develop a, a global neurologic injury that also affects their metabolism. They start to fall off growth curves. They start to you know, regress their neurologic development. Suddenly they go from speaking a few words to nonverbal. They go from great eye contact and engagement to un un uh, the inability to make eye can't contact, and they really revert. They'll go from crawling or walking to being flaccid, and so they have this huge reversion. So we have this huge neurologic injury, and the last thing that we thought as doctors is this was somehow related to bacteria around them. But lo and behold, one of the best therapies we have out there is increasing the amount of bacterial diversity in these children. So this was a great randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial that was interesting. They took oral vancomycin, which is a potent antibiotic, wipes out gut flora to a huge degree. So they gave them two weeks of, of an antibiotic to wipe out their gut flora, and then they took healthy controlled fecal transplant and put the fecal material from non-affected individuals in these autistic kids, and they see this dramatic improvement. It's like 80% improvement in symptomatology uh, among a number of the neurologic outcomes. So we're seeing proof in therapeutic fashion in children highly affected with autism that if we change their microbiome, their brain starts working better. It's an extraordinary story. Now, if that's true for autism, can it be true for cancer? And the reality is we, this is starting to improve for the last kind of eight years, but now the story is just getting so fascinating. This study came out in 2014. This was a qualitative survey of the breast microbiota in the DNA. So this is not microbiome in the gut that's now talking to the breast, which we know can happen. This is actually microbiome existing in the human breast. This study was profound. What they did was they biopsied the affected breast in women with cancer with breast cancer, and showed the microbiome DNA pattern. And what they showed again and again is that the enriched microbiome was this methylobacterium, the radial intolerance. This bacteria was highly present in tumor tissue, and if they biopsied the opposite breast in the same woman, they found a completely different uh, bacteria there. And the DNA there was the sphingomonas, which is a relative of pseudomonas, which is common in hospitals. And so it suddenly looked like, oh my gosh, is breast cancer actually an infectious process? And you get the wrong bacteria into the breast, and suddenly you've got a cancerous process. But isn't it fascinating for a moment to back up and say, there is normal bacteria, there is healthy bacteria in a normal breast. Who's ever heard of that? I, I lecture to doctors all the time, and it's like jaws on the ground, because we've been taught that any bacteria in tissue is called cellulitis, and we should prescribe antibiotics. But what we're seeing is there's actually supposed to be bacteria living within our tissues, nursemating, taking care of the human physiology. And the reason why this is really proving out is because this study also looked to see the DNA load. So how much of those bacteria are present in the cancer and what is the cancer's behavior? And what they showed in the second half of this little paragraph here is that the more aggressive the cancer, the less bacteria were present, i.e. the more sterile that tumor got, the more likely it was to kill the woman. That's fascinating story and terrifying when you look at our birth rates. 47% of American births, especially in most municipal areas, is by C-section. We're birthing sterile children. They don't travel through the vaginal birth canal. Instead, they get pulled out through a sterile incision in the abdomen of the woman and placed on hospital table hospital gurney or a hospital scale. They just inherited not mom's microbiome, but hospital microbiome. What's the prevalence of cancer going to be in these children that are born sterile and then by age one are seeing all kinds of complications because their immune system's not functioning and they start getting hit with more antibiotics, more sterilization happening, and the reality is we are going to lose the ability for the human body to regulate normal metabolism, normal 
fuel delivery to the breast or any other organ system, and we're going to get more and more cancer as we're seeing across the population. So that's a couple of spectrums, but let's look to the brain of the adult now, because we started with the brain of the child. This is a fascinating study that's starting to show us something interesting about fungi. And so the other side of the microbiota, or the microbiome, is the fungal environment. And this one outstrips the bacterial environment big time. There's only about 30 to 40,000 species of bacteria, 5 million species of fungi. We are so grossly outnumbered by the microbiome, and the, and the, and the big piece here is definitely these fungi. These are looking at control brains and, and Alzheimer's affected brains uh, in a couple of very specific areas related to the, uh, the memory centers in the brain. And what you're seeing on the left is just localization of the nuclei with the brain, and then the center column you're looking at fungi. You're looking at the mycelium type structure within the fungi that's surrounding these nuclei. And so what you're seeing is controlled in uh, uh, Alzheimer's, then controlled in Alzheimer's. And so there's bright green fungal elements within the brain of that Alzheimer's patient. And like the story with the breast cancer, the immediate assumption is, oh my gosh, Alzheimer's is actually an infectious disease of fungi. But then, of course, we find out within a year of that that this is actually correlating with a better outcome. If you don't have fungal elements visible on that, then, then it's more likely your Alzheimer's is going to be more aggressive. Now, let's think about what's happening here. In your garden, if you, if you clear-cut a garden, if you strip out uh, all of the, the thing, you rototill down the normal flora in the garden, what's going to pop up first? Weeds. But if you have a shovel and you dig below the weeds, before the weeds show up, you're going to show tiny little white fibrils starting to shoot through the soil. And those are the mycelium, or the root system of the fungi. These guys are the intelligence system of the entire planet. These guys can detect very small trace amounts of de deficiencies in trees nearby or other plants and transport nutrients from all over the environment to fuel those trees. We're starting to realize that like birch grow near the pines all the time because the birch are notoriously deficient in a number of minerals that are provided by the pines. So the pines will sequester this and then they'll fuel it through the my mycelium of the soil over to the birch. And so this incredible biodynamic environment is happening through the mycelium. And it's starting to look like this is happening in our body all the time. When we clear cut an area with stress, chemical, toxin, or et cetera in the brain, the first thing that needs to move in in a stressed environment is the mycelium. And so we're literally staining the brains of humans that will have that pattern of fungal environment in their brain for years. And they don't manifest fungal symptoms. The fungus is always you know, the most terrifying thing. I used to work in the bone marrow transplant unit. And in a bone marrow transplant unit, if you get a fungal infection in a bone marrow transplant patient, they're dead within three days. And so we fear bacteria in, in the hospital setting, but we are terrified of fungal environments. But in reality, if you have a non-sterile environment, if you have a normal, healthy ecosystem, if you start to develop distress in an organ system, you're going to have the fungal elements showing up. You're going to have bacteria starting to compensate in the diseased breast. The reason why it looks like this other form of bacteria starts to form around the tumor uh, site of a woman's breast that's starting to have problems is because that's the only bacteria that's really good at surviving in highly acidic environments. And so years before that bacteria made the shift, that woman started to develop a stress pattern. Most of this is emotional stress or psychological stress that is put in by social norms, roles, etc. This is right on the maternal axis, so it's maternal stress, stress about one's own family, stress about your role in the provision of that wellness of that family that gets centered in that breast meridian. So we have this accumulating stress and the toxicity starts to develop, acidity starts to develop, and of course, worse nutrition, a, a sterilization of the bacteria, all these things can accelerate that stress pattern. But as things get really acidic and really, you have to shift the microbiome to a, a bacteria that can survive it. And so what we're seeing again and again, whether it's an, a brain of an Alzheimer's patient or the breast of a woman who's developing cancer, is the microbiome is doing damage control to the best of its ability. And what do we keep doing as physicians? What do we keep doing? We keep sterilizing. We prescribe antibiotics endlessly, antifungals, antivirals. We have all of these things that we pile on the patient. There's a golden ratio of thrive. And I want you guys to think about this because a lot of times when you walk through a hall like this and you've got a thousand different products, all of which cost money, I certainly don't make enough money to be on 10 of those products a month, let alone all of them. And so it's hard for us. We get overwhelmed sometimes with what am I supposed to do? 
You come away from a weekend like this and you're excited, but you're also completely overwhelmed with information. I want you to be able to just rest on this, this graph here, or this simple ratio. You have a rate of injury in your life and you have a rate of repair. If those are equal, you're never gonna age. If you start to age or you start to develop disorder or disease, you're simply injuring at a faster rate than a repair. And everything that you do to balance out that repair mechanism, accelerate the repair and decrease the injury is gonna improve the outcome. And so what I recommend is, is diversification of your toolbox. Don't feel like you have to do everything today. Just do one thing today, which is decrease the amount of injury in your body. And that might be avoiding a toxin in your life. You know, and that might be actually a toxic relationship as much as something else in your life. But go to your core, get out of your head, this thing will kill you. You, you start to think you're, you're pretty much dead. And so you gotta get out of your head and come into your core space and ask, what is the most toxic thing that I'm doing to myself today? What is the most injurious process that I'm doing today? And I can tell you, for me right now, it's a lack of sleep. I do a lot of things right in my life, but I travel too much, I do, it's a lack of sleep. It's, it, and I know it immediately when I go here. And so you guys all ask yourself, what is the one thing? And start there, and know that as soon as you shift that one thing, you've just changed this balance radically. And you can give that time. Give that time and then ask yourself again, what is my next thing? And so that's an exciting thing that, as overwhelming as all this industry is that we're, we're a part of, we can boil it down to one safe rule of thumb. You've got an injury and a repair rate and you can change that dramatically. So what is chronic inflammation? This is the root of all disorder and disease ultimately, is chronic inflammation. And you can't pick up a, a journal article these days, and you guys are, as biohackers have read more about inflammation than maybe a, any other subset of our population, and so I don't need to go into great depth, but I want to re remind you that acute inflammation is awesome. Acute inflammation is so powerful. It is what makes you stronger, not weaker each day. If you don't have acute inflammation, you would die very quickly. You would die of overwhelming infection. You would die with inability to repair your bones. You would die very, very quickly. My favorite thing is bone fracture. This is, osteoporosis is a completely fake disease. We made it up by a scan, right? We created the DEXA scan and said, you have below average bone mineral density. You have a high fracture rate. Therefore, we should put you on drugs. Well, of course, we're comparing those women to 35-year-old women. Is it a rational thing? No, it's not. It's a completely made up disease process. And what do we do? We make women afraid of bone fracture. Well, if you're afraid of fracture, what do you do? You just try to not do anything that might break a bone. But of course, what you need to do is you need to go out and break as many bones as possible, as fast as possible, if you're diagnosed with low bone mineral density. The difference is you don't want to break the entire bone. You want to do millions of tiny microfractures within the bone. And so if I jump off this stage right now, 10,000, 10 million, hundreds of millions of microfractures in my bone. Huge, huge amount of injury just happened in my body. And I'm gonna create a huge feedback problem in a second if I don't get back on that stage. All right, and so that little thing is being mimicked by these vibrating platforms out here that you've seen and things like that. Any percussion of the bone immediately induces this, an acute inflammatory reaction that makes you stronger, not weaker. In the case of bone, osteoclasts come in and chew up the little microfractures that just happened in the trabecula of my bone. And then minutes later, they call an osteoblast, which lay down new bone. And the bone density increases, not decreases, over that process of an osteoclast, osteoblast, osteoclast, osteoblast. I'm an endocrinologist. Endocrinologists got famous for treating osteoporosis, a fake disease, and we created a bunch of drugs that, of course, are abnormal chemical compounds that we now put into women's bodies in massive amounts. And what does it do? It blocks, this says fix your mic on it. Am I supposed to do something? It's falling off my ear? All right, I appreciate that tip. You guys have a good vision back there. All right, so the, as you get this uh, acute inflammatory reaction, you get stronger, not weaker, until you see an endocrinologist, and then they put you on a drug that blocks the ability of osteoclasts to be mobilized. And now, of course, we know after seven to 10 years on one of these drugs for osteoporosis, your risk of fracture of the femur goes up. Well, that's ironic. The reason why it's happening is because it's blocking this acute inflammatory reaction. Now, that's a fraction of the population compared to the famous statin drugs. If we can do one public health event, if there is anybody on the statin drug in this room, please stop it today. Do or don't talk to your doctor, I don't really care. 
but do stop that drug. There is nothing that stops the acute inflammatory process faster than a statin drug. The main thing that drives repair in your body, the main antioxidant made by your liver is LDL cholesterol. Who's been told LDL is a bad cholesterol? Come on, everybody's been told LDL is a bad cholesterol. LDLR, the reductant LDL, is made by your liver to treat inflammation in your blood vessels. Whoa, what an extraordinary truth. And what an extraordinary thing that we've spent the last 40 years developing drugs that more and more potently block our ability to make LDL cholesterol, our main antioxidant made by the, by the liver. If you get accumulation of cholesterol in a blood vessel, it's because you overwhelmed the body's ability to clean out the LDL. The LDL did exactly what it was supposed to do, move into the blood vessel, donate an electron, i.e. a reductant, reduce inflammation, and then get cleaned up by a macrophage, which is the big sweeper system, put back into the bloodstream, attached to HDL, and taken back to the liver. Who's been told HDL is the good cholesterol? Everybody's been told that. HDL is just a carrier for LDL. There's nothing good about it. it doesn't, it's not an antioxidant. LDL is the antioxidant. And so you guys are, the reason I bring that up and, and take your time to tell you that is most of you are checking your cholesterol panels all the time. We heard somebody up here on stage saying they were checking it twice a week. It was dumbfounding to me. I, I can't even imagine. That's an extraordinary amount of data. But if you're checking your cholesterol all the time, keep in mind what it means. If you have a high LDL, it just means your liver knows there's lots of inflammation in your body. Last thing you want to do is block that thing. Red yeast rice. Anybody been told that's a good alternative to statins? Please never go on a red yeast rice. That stuff is 10 times more potent than your best statin at blocking the HMG coenzyme. It, it kills human cells so fast in culture. If you put red yeast rice into the cell culture with renal tubule cells, for example, of the kidney, you'll kill them all in about two hours. Extremely potent oxidant. And so this is the problem with a lot of functional medicine, integrative medicine, that I now would consider myself in that field of integrative medicine we have tended to kick the allopathic doctor off the stool and then climb right back up on the same stool and say, well, here's a better alternative. Here's a natural alternative. Be aware that all of the drugs we use were extracted from plants, all of them. And then, of course, they were chemically modified and they can screw things up further. But just because it's from nature doesn't mean that we should use it in a drug effect. So we need to be very aware of this acute inflammatory process, respect it, call it into action, and try not to block this normal pathway. The problem only happens if we start to get chronic inflammation, of course, which is what happens if you get injured so frequently that you can't respond, you run out of the reservoir of coping mechanism for this acute inflammatory action. This, in a nutshell, is something important you can just take home. So you've got a ratio of injury and repair, Lesson number one. Number two, chronic inflammation is a loss of communication at the cell level. If you have unperturbed access to information at the cell level, you can never have a diseased cell. Disease is, by definition, an accumulation of injury due to a lack of communication with the environment. It's isolation of a cell, and nowhere is this more true than in a cancer cell. A cancer cell is, by definition, the most lonely cell, most vulnerable cell, most terrified cell in your body. It can't kill itself, it's lost the ability to kill itself, but more importantly, it's lost the ability to realize that it's part of a 70 trillion celled organism called a human. And the fascinating, beautiful thing about biology is the very fabric of life, every single cell is programmed for an overwhelming drive for survival, for life itself. And that's mysterious, we don't know where that's coming from in a single cell. But if a cell gets so isolated that it forgets and it can't find out that it's part of a 70 trillion cell organism, it's going to start to just have drive for life. And it's going to start replicating as fast as it can because it knows it's too damaged to survive. It has the shortest lifespan of any cell in your body as a cancer cell. Very, very weak cell. It's dying all the time. And so its only option for survival is proliferation. And we then call that a tumor and then we call that a disease, and then we create a $400 billion industry of chemotherapy around it. It's the most lonely cell in your body. If you want to combat cancer, love yourself back into yourself. Love your cancer. My patients that come through my clinic, a year out from entering that clinic, I hear again and again, the biggest gift in my life was my cancer. 
And I believe that's the truth about any disease that we are isolate or are diagnosed. It is your opportunity in your biologic assay that is real for you to say, I was going in the wrong direction. Well, I don't particularly care anymore about cancer or no cancer in my patients. What I care about is your purpose. The heck are you here for to do? You showed up. You showed up with 70 trillion cells that are going to work in concert to carry out a mission. And if I, as a doctor, now step into your life and distract your purpose with this huge, terrifying story of cancer and chemotherapy and all these terrifying choices, you are missing your mission. And so step one that we have to do as consumers is stop fearing the diagnosis and start seeing it as an empowering moment to say, I've got to switch direction so I can find purpose. So we're going to start to accelerate because I wasn't going fast enough yet. <laughs> loss of ecosystem, is it, could it be that the loss of the ecosystem around us is causing this entire imbalance, this massive epidemic of disease around us? Is it really the cause? And I'm going to say, if that's true, then we should look to the biggest toxin on the planet, and this would be this chemical right here, glyphosate. If you haven't heard of it, it's the active ingredient in Roundup, which was developed by a company you've never heard of called Monsanto. <laughs> and that, that chemical was actually patented in 1957 by a Japanese researcher who was so scared of his own invention that he put it on a shelf and decided it should never come out to the public. Why? Because it's a water-soluble organophosphate. The other organophosphate that you guys have heard of is called Agent Orange. Remember that chemical? A little Vietnam era here. What did we use it for? To kill the trees. To defoliate the trees so that why? So we could kill more Viet Cong. Well, that's really a great mention. And so we were killing plants to see them. So we got done with the war and we found out that thing was super carcinogenic. All the soldiers they got exposed to were developing skin problems immediately, precancerous stuff. And now, of course, the VA is full of cancer survivors and cancer patients that were exposed to Agent Orange. So the company, again, Monsanto, didn't know, you know or, or couldn't figure out how to get that thing out to the public because as soon as the war ended, they were out of you know, a, a market share. And so they turned their attention to other organophosphates. So they went to the Japanese research and said, hey, are you doing anything with that? And no, I'm not doing anything with that. So they bought it for just pennies on the dollar. And they repatented. And they repatented that not as a weed killer, as which it would be. It got patented as an antibiotic. Why? Because it kills every single cellular organism it touches. And so this stuff is a potent antibiotic, kills every type of, of bacteria on the planet pretty much, and it does so by blocking this pathway. It's called the, the shikimate pathway. It's a group of enzymes that are responsible for making important nutrients in plants and in soil, from the bacteria, the fungi, the plants. All of these guys have the shikimate pathway. Well, now glyphosate's been repatented as an antifungal, an antiparasite, three times an antibiotic. All of these patents showing that, boy, this thing kills everything. Isn't that fantastic? How does it kill a plant? It kills the plant by stopping the ability for the plant to make the essential proteins that would build the plant in the first place. And as you've seen in your garden, if you spray Roundup, it's not 24 to 36 hours later, that plant's dead. How does it do that so fast? It does it by completely robbing that plant of its ability to make the basic proteins that would make that plant a plant. The shikimate pathway produces the aromatic amino acids, these three, phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan. There's only 26 amino acids, which is a lot like the alphabet. 26 letters builds hundreds of thousands of words. What would happen if we subtracted three letters out of the alphabet? Would that screw up some words? Hundreds of thousands of words would be screwed up all of a sudden. We have done this to our entire food chain. Unfortunately, these three made through the shikimate pathway are part of the eight that we call essential amino acids, meaning you cannot make them in the human body because you do not have a shikimate pathway. And this is exactly what Monsanto has been saying to all the regulators is, hey, it's safe as water to humans because humans don't even have a shikimate pathway. What could it possibly do to harm a human because it doesn't hit the, well, never mind that that shikimate pathway is where we get our essential amino acids to build a healthy human body. And now we are building children that are two generations into an environment where they cannot find in the soil or the plants enough of these enzymes to build a healthy body. We are building children that are deficient a few letters in the alphabet. The aromatic amino acids are used to synthesize proteins, hormones in the plants and in humans. Perhaps more terrifying though, it makes the alkaloids. The alkaloids are so fascinating. This is a science that's just waiting to come to fruition. Has anybody heard of plant plasmids in a biohacking lecture? 
I'm so excited not to see any hands go up because I would have been super disappointed because this is probably what I'm going to spend the next 10 years talking to you guys about because I don't know anything about it yet. We are scratching the surface of the potential. What does that thing look like to you guys? Is there anything that that thing looks like? Mitochondria. You guys are masters of the mitochondria. Guess what? Bacteria do not have mitochondria. This was my big discovery in 2012 as we found some redox signaling molecules coming out of the soil and we were like, how are those guys there? How is it possible that, that these compounds that we would expect from mitochondria would exist in the soil? And the answer was they were coming from bacteria and fungi. They were coming from the rootlets of plants themselves. There was this rich amount of these carbon-based carriers of redox signaling, and it was probably coming entirely from these plastids. And so the plant plastids are these incredible structures that look a lot like mitochondria, and they make an incredible amount of important compounds that are called the alkaloids. These are the anti-malarials, anti-asthma, anti-cancer, cholinemetics, that would be the, the neurotransmitter, neuromodulatory compounds, the vasodilators that would prevent hypertension, the antiarrhythmics that would prevent heart attacks, the analgesics that would prevent chronic pain, the antihyperglycemics that would prevent diabetes. What would the population look like if 20 years ago we started to remove the ability of plants to make these compounds? Well, it's pretty simple. We'd see a lot more infectious disease, we'd see a lot more asthma, we'd see a lot more cancer, we'd see a lot more neurologic conditions, we'd see a lot of hypertension, we'd see a lot of heart attacks, we'd see a ton of chronic pain syndrome suddenly come out of nowhere, we'd see an enormous amount of diabetes spring out of nowhere. Well, that must not have happened. We have literally built ourselves a food system that no longer is our medicine. That was Hippocrates, right? A couple thousand years ago, let thy food be thy medicine. That ah, worked pretty well until 1975. Then the age of Aquarius and all that hit, and Al Gore and the internet, and it was all downhill. <laughs> we literally are building a food chain for our children that don't have the nutrients that would become the medicinals in their body. It's not an accident, I don't think, by business plan that Monsanto has always been owned by pharmaceutical companies. Because it's a pretty good business model. It's not a conspiracy theory, it's just kind of clever. What if on the front side we removed the, the natural medicinals from food and we see an increase in requirements of that population to have our drugs? And so for every dollar we make f selling food that's deficient in nutrient on the front side, we make 10 to $20 on the back side, giving back the pharmaceutical drugs that would replace the medicinal factor of there. Now, is that a conscious thing or is that a subconscious thing? Is this a march of our insanity? Is this part of a necessary mistake we're making in our human consciousness? I think yes, yes, and yes, and yes. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is just us. And we are creating this as consumers. We stopped growing our own food. We demanded that the chemical companies step up and do chemical farming. Is it possible that the chemical farming is going beyond just stripping out the nutrients? Is it possible that Monsanto and the others are wrong? All five big chemical companies in the United States now make this chemical. It came off patent in 2007. So now Dow and 3M and all these guys make glyphosate. But that pales in comparison to what's happening over in China. When it went off patent, China started making the vast majority of the glyphosate on the market, and they signed a free trade agreement with Australia in 2007, came off patent, they made it, signed a free trade agreement in Australia, suddenly dumped an enormous amount of cheap, cheap glyphosate into the industry in 2007 into Australia. And what do we see in 2017? Highest rates of asthma in the whole world. Childhood asthma in Australia is now one in four children. Turns out that asthma is a symptom of leaky gut. It's a symptom of high permeability in the first section of the duodenum in the small intestine. And it leads to bronchospasm in the lung. Asthma is not a disease of the lung at all. But what was the last time that some kid went to an allergist and said, I've got asthma, and they were given an, a probiotic or something for the gut? Never happens. But we are literally creating this disease of asthma in our children, which of course is just a symptom of breakdown here, and so they've got eczema, food allergies, all the rest, because they're lacking that microbiome. And so is it possible that we're actually doing something direct to these human intestines? We're not just stripping away the medicines. We're not just doing this. Is it possible we're causing an opening, a global injury to the population, to the human cells themselves that would predict this enormous burst of disease, not just in the gut, but in every other organ system in the body? Intercellular tight junctions, the firewalls of defense. These are intelligent gatekeepers that are like Velcro that have a brain. You remember the portal uh, systems in Star Wars? You know, some little ship flies up to the big Death Star and these little portal doors open. They let the, their 
good guys in and they close the door and nobody else can get in. That's happening in every single blood vessel in your body a million times a second right now. The entire wall of your blood vessel is opening up and allowing white blood cells to leave the, the vasculature, travel through your tissue to a site of injury. It closes up right behind that. Imagine the complexity of the doors that would open and close, letting single massive cells through the wall without any leak. Literally, the plasma in your blood isn't leaking into your tissue through those portal doors. These are the most intelligent, most incredible structures in the body are these tight junctions. And let's take a look what happens. And not only are they in blood vessels, of course, that blood vessel is responsible for the blood-brain barrier. Blood-brain barrier, of course, is the, that holy of holies, but it's also responsible for the kidney tubules that would do the detoxification of your body. So what would happen to the population if we destroyed the tight junctions on the front side? All those trillion cells that make up your largest membrane, your gut, starting at your sinuses and running all the way through your intestinal tree, what would happen if we added a chemical to your food, water, air, and rainfall that would tear that apart? Well, you would suddenly open up the front end, you would start to get overwhelming activation of your immune system, which lies right behind that membrane, and then you would start to get vascular leak, and you would start to get all kinds of things from your bloodstream into your brain, into the peripheral nerves that would decrease the metabolic function of those things, but would also increase their exposure to the toxicity of your environment, whether it was plastics, metals, heavy metals, whatever it is in your system, suddenly you're leaking through the whole system, and then you perturb the kidney, and so you can't detox the system. We would literally, as a population, turn into sponges for toxin. And that's exactly what an autistic kid is. Somebody who is now overwhelmed on both ends of the spectrum is now just sucking toxin out of their environment and, and harboring it in their body, and they have metabolic and neurologic collapse. So this is what our lab has become infamous for, is a bunch of work we've done on the, on the intestinal membranes. This is looking at the small intestine and that intestinal wall here is tied together with tight junctions, the Velcro thing that we're highlighting in green here with an antibody that's tagged with the glowing protein from a jellyfish. And so we do a jellyfish tagged antibody to ZO1, which is Zonulocludins 1 protein, which is a big part of that Velcro structure. And then we add glyphosate at the amount you'd see in a typical conventionally grown beet or turnip or uh, sweet potato, which are three of my favorite foods that I put all my patients on. Within 16 minutes, you see collapse of the membrane. No longer do you have a cohesive membrane, you have collapse and you have complete permeability of that membrane. 16 minutes from exposure at 10 to 20 parts per million of glyphosate. We published a paper last year that I don't have time to go into right now, but you're welcome to look at. It turns out that glyphosate is the reason gluten sensitivity has happened. Glyphosate is the thing that's induced an intestinal change that makes us sensitive to gluten as a population. We didn't have gluten sensitivity until about 1994. In 1992, we started spraying wheat with glyphosate to use it as a desiccant. It's the only crop that you want to kill before you harvest it. And so we started killing the wheat early so that perhaps in northern farming environments we could suddenly get two crops, not one crop, out of the same growing season. Really good business plan for a farmer who's hardly making it, so it was an easy sell by Monsanto, but little did they know they were adding the toxin that would become the synergy or the sensitizer to that gluten to our gut so that we would suddenly develop gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. Number of acres sprayed with glyphosate, uh, as far as number of acres of wheat sprayed with glyphosate compared to the bar graph of the occurrence or the prevalence of celiac disease in the country overlaps perfectly. And so we have this incredible correlation of these two compounds. We have another um, publication coming up out in the next few months. You can check our website in three to six months, see if it's there yet. But we've figured out now the exact molecular mechanism by which this is happening. And it's a very interesting one where this glyphosate chemical is coming in inducing a hypoxic injury to the gut lining. And the reaction of the gut is to make a receptor called CXCR3, which is the receptor that will grab gliadin, which is a breakdown product of gluten. That receptor doesn't exist in the healthy gut. And you guys have experienced this. You guys go over to, to Europe. We go into an environment where the glyphosate exposure is tiny, and suddenly you're eating pasta and your bread, and you're like, man, this place is awesome. I'm, I feel great. And then you're like, I must have been cured of my gluten sensitivity. And then you come back to the United States and like, oh my god, that's the worst bloating I've ever had in my life. I got brain fog, for, brain fog for four days. It's a horrendous destruction because you're so deficient. What's happening is you're getting overwhelmed. Right behind that gut membrane is your immune system. Some 70% of the immune system lies right behind that gut lining. That huge coral reef-like environment of 30,000 species of bacteria and fungi, if it was booming, your immune system would never have to cope with the outside environment. But as it starts to form leak, and you're starting to leak because you have a destruction of the microbiome, so you don't have your front line of defense, you don't have the incredible communication network to support, 
Then you get that direct glyphosate injury to the gut lining. Now your immune system's overwhelmed. What just happened is you had a loss of self-identity at, at the cell level. What just happened is you had a loss of self-identity at the cell level. Your immune system can no longer tell the difference between the outside world that it should be attacking and your body. What would happen if we eroded the, our self-identity? We would develop a huge epidemic of autoimmune disease. You don't have to because this is kind of HIPAA violation probably on some level, but if you want to just raise your hand if you've been diagnosed or you have an immediate family member that's been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, thyroid, anything else. Yeah, massive. 25% of the American population now with an autoimmune disease. Such an erosion of self-identity that one in four of us is attacking our own body out of confusion of who we are at the cell level. Why do you think our children are shooting each other in our schools? Why do you think something like Las Vegas can happen? over and over again, every day. We heard about Las Vegas, big flat, blah, blah. That's happening every day. In every inner city environment, some kid is taking the life of some other kid. Every single day, thousands of children dying from gun violence in our cities. Why? We have forgotten that we're a bigger part of the organism. We have forgotten that we are one as human beings. We've gotten so isolated and so eroded that we are behaving exactly like a cancer cell. We will kill everything else to protect ourselves. We are a cancer as we become isolated. And that's the stunning environment that we're in. All over your body that erosion is happening. The war on the microbiome is happening faster and faster. Let's take a look at the antibiotic prescriptions from doctors and our cancer deaths. This is 2010 era. The darker the state on your right, the more antibiotics prescribed. Look at the state by state correlation with death by cancer. Doctors are killing patients by making them more sterile. Let's look at glyphosate, the number one worldwide antibiotic by far, two billion kilograms, five billion pounds a year being dumped into our soils worldwide. That antibiotic should be an incredible correlation with our cancer rates worldwide. And the most of that has been dumped in the last four years when we've seen this explosion of autism and the rest going on. And so it's happening. So there's 1992 on your far left. Uh, the next one is, is 2011 with our glyphosate spraying map. And you'll see a poor correlation here, and I hate poor correlations. This is bad public science when we say, look at all that glyphosate. It should correlate perfectly with the amount of cancer in those states, and it's not showing up. Why is that? Because it doesn't stay put. It's a water-soluble toxin. It's going to travel with the water systems. And so let's overlay that now with the Mississippi River uh, tributaries, which are pulling all that glyphosate out of the whole Midwest and the northern United States, putting it into a single water system, and the highest rates of cancer in the entire developed world is in the last 90 miles between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Wow. Well, that's some crazy stuff. Here's women's mortality worsening since 1993 to 2006 by county. Same overlying pattern, except this time you see a high correlation even in the spraying environment. So women's endocrine systems seem to be very sensitive to the glyphosate. They're going to show an increase in mortality even in areas where it hasn't concentrated in the water systems yet. And so I think that we're seeing one in four women infer infertile right now because of their sensitivity. 25% of the American population in, in fertile women are now infertile. We are only about 15 years away from the tipping point where we can no longer replace ourselves as Americans because we have such high rates of infertility. Here's the cancer rates in 1970 and 1994 on your left. This is death from colon, prostate, and lung cancer. See, it's all up in the northwest and the northeast there. This proved that voting a Democratic ticket causes death from cancer. <laughs> but lo and behold, in 2000 2011, voting Republican suddenly killed you. And so it's an interesting reversal of this map of death from cancer. This should be absolutely impossible if, in fact, cancer is a genetic disease, but it's not. It is, in fact, that same pattern. We have to love back our ecosystem. If we're going to survive and our children are going to survive, we have to love back the ecosystem. And so we need to call back in the thousands of species of bacteria, the th hundreds of thousands of species of parasites, the five million species of fungi, 10 to the 31 viruses on planet Earth right now. That's 10 million times more viruses than our stars, not in the galaxy, but in the entire universe. 10 to the 31 viruses on this planet. If these guys were against us, we would be dead. They are for us. They are for life. They are part of life. They're the reason life exists. We need to be ultimately bioteching from these bacteria and these fungi and these viruses. And that's what we've been doing. We've been pulling the biotech out of the bacteria and the fungi of 50 million years ago, 
fossil soils, when we're pulling out these carbon snowflakes that we discovered in 2012, that supplements become a phenomenon, not because I'm intelligent, but because the biome is freaking intelligent. Imagine a microbiome that humans have never even seen before, producing a communication network, each species producing something unique to create a wireless communication network for the human body to plug us back into self. And what we see is this incredible restoration of protein synthesis. You add this in and suddenly the gut is wrapping itself back tight again, and we're getting this incredible fortitude against the toxins in our environment, including glyphosate. The fiber optic cables, the gap junctions, these are fiber optic cables that literally li lead between one cell to the next to transmit electrical light energy from one cell to the next. These are the guys that break apart to cause the isolation of cancer and the loneliness. And they get glued back together. They're exquisite pipelines with these apertures allowing energy to flow across the system. If, the, if we put back in this communication network, we get this massive increase in glutathione, which is your main antioxidant. Isn't it fascinating that the acute inflammatory pathway is not even regulated by the human cells? The microbiome is regulating your production of glutathione. This is just after 18 hours of exposure, you've got a thousand-fold increase in glutathione production from the small intestine. You're moving the whole immune system back towards acute, not chronic inflammation. You're re recouping the reservoir because of the microbiome. Stem cells, this is two hours after a single use in a human. And so after a single use, two hours later, we see a 20 to 30% increase in stem cell activation, CD1 to 33 markers in the urine. Not regulated by the human cells, regulated by the microbiome. That's telling your body, rebuild, rebuild, because you have purpose. We know your purpose. We love you. We need to love our microbiome back into existence. And so I'm going to fast forward here to what I want you guys to think about. Of course, we're destroying the microbiome from day one of life through. This is what it looks like. So take a picture of that because I don't have time to run through that. But that's kind of from birth to death, the pattern of chronic inflammatory conditions that you're going to see. And so if you're clinicians, you're going to be able to identify now where, the, where every patient walking into your clinic falls into that cascade. How are you going to reverse that? You're going to reconnect your patients to the microbiome. Get them back in the pharmacy of food. You're going to change the injury and repair ratio by getting them back in contact with the little ones, the invisible nature around us. So you're going to support vaginal birthing. If they are born by C-section, make sure that grandchild of yours is swabbed immediately by mom's vaginal mucus. Take that vaginal swab, swab down her vagina, swab the baby's nose, ears, throat, face. Get that kid buried and covered in mom's flora. Get that kid a chance. Avoid antibiotics as much as possible. Eat organic. Grow your own food. Breathe as many ecosystems as you can. Most of the solutions from the microbiome are going to come from breathing them, not eating them. Weed your garden with your hands. Amazing things happen when you don't just spray a plant on the ground to kill it. You bend over and you pull the roots out. Big plume of fungi and bacteria go airborne. You breathe that in. You replete your own microbiome. Powerful, powerful stuff. Touch the earth and your food. Stand barefoot in the grass and soil. You want a special biohack on life? You want way more time in your life? Don't get dressed in the morning. Oh my gosh, the amount of time we spend on these clothes is ridiculous. <laughs> Just go naked for God's sakes. Get it going on. There is a National Naked Gardening Day. I highly recommend you honor that day. And so find your national day. Eat fermented foods, some amazing groups here. The fermentation fairy is in your presence here. So find the fermentation fairy right up front here. And so she is incredible. You want a wild ferment. Most of the ferments on the market are just another probiotic. Probiotics are narrowing your ecosystem, not widening your ecosystem. So let those wild ferments get back in your life. And generally, you need to hug more people. Hug and generally love the people back into your life, and you're going to get a crazy amount of microbiome. <laughs>